Good morning, Mint's community. Thanks so much for joining us for another YouTube video brought to you by the Merrimack Institute for New Teacher Support at Merrimack College. Today we are joined by Dr. Caitlin Kirkle, who is an Assistant Professor of Human Development and Human Services in the School of Education and Social Policy at Merrimack College. Dr. Kirkle's area of expertise focuses on social cognitive development in early childhood. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today and to share your slides with us. Thank you for having me. So today I want to talk to you a little bit um, about how we apply developmental theories to remote learning in the current state that we're in as practitioners and as parents. So the question that I have for you today is should I Piaget or should I Vygotsky? And for many of you, those names are probably bringing back flashbacks to uh, your undergraduate education, or for some of you, you might not even know who I'm talking about. So I hope that I can provide some insight today on thinking about teaching and learning and what we know from these theorists and how it should inform what we're doing today in this remote environment. So I first want to challenge you to think about how do children actually learn about the world? We have this young boy here, and he's contemplating trying to wrap his head around or understand volume versus weight. So on the one hand, he might sort of answer this question by turning to a teacher, turning to an educator, some type of an informant who can provide him with the information that he so seeks. On the other hand, he may turn to experimentation, right? And he could take these little bell weights and put them in the scale and sort of try to understand what is the difference here between volume and weight. Indeed, we know from theorists that how children learn has been thought about from even the 1700s and philosophers like Rousseau, who came about or concluded that children do not truly learn when other people answer their questions. So arguably, children should be left to discover their own, their own understanding of their world. Piaget um, had a similar thought in that knowledge itself is derived from the action. So we think about children as little scientists, as contemporaries of Piaget state like Gopnik and Meltzer. But there are other folks that say, okay, if we simply tell them what to do and what we want them to know, it leaves the child cold and it doesn't leave them again to explore and to further their thinking, developing a deeper understanding of a concept that they're curious about. That's all fine and good, right? When you have content like volume versus weight, or um, trying to learn things, for instance, like what happens when a ball goes down an inclined plane. But what about when children want to learn things such as the shape of the earth? If we left them just to discover what the shape of the earth is, they probably would falsely conclude that the earth is flat by looking at images, for instance, of maps, so on and so forth. So it's in this way that we must rely on some type of an expert or informant to share certain or specific information. It's only through that informant or that expert that they could really describe the earth as a sphere. So this leads us to conclude or realize that although in many cases, allowing children to discover and learn through their own actions and as a product of their own curiosity, not all learning can be achieved through experience. I just provided you with the example of the shape of the earth, but things like religion, mythology, right? Historical events that cannot be observed. Moral judgments, for instance, discriminating right and wrong. And then what about sort of our fantasy world? All of these things, must be explained to children. They're exposed to some testimony, whether it's from an adult, a television show, a peer, a book, right, that influences their understanding in these domains as well as other domains. So how do I use this information and think about my teaching and think about my content, right? And this, I think, is probably a very, um, widely shared cartoon in the higher ed world, but also in thinking about um, teaching 
in high school and middle school and elementary school that, you know, we begin strong as a semester. Then we're told there's this possible plan for remote teaching. We're making the plan. And then what our actual teaching look like, looks like doesn't even match the plan, right? It's not as strong as the other legs of the course. So how can we strengthen that? How can we bolster our remote teaching? And as parents, how can we assume the role as, of a teacher when we ourselves don't have any training? What I want you to think about is what is the content that you're being asked to disseminate or to share with the child in front of you? Whether it's being done remotely, in a class that's been de-densified, or you are the parent acting as a teacher. First, if the content can be learned through play and experimentation, allow your child to discover. Okay, this can be thought about across the lifespan. Historically, play-based learning and discovery learning was um, precluded to or only thought about for early childhood. But what's to say that our adolescents can't play and can't discover with manipulatives? So provide them with those opportunities. Think about simple household objects that can teach principles of physics, for instance, to your high schooler, or for your early childhood kiddo, your preschooler. Think about how you can find acorns in the backyard that can lead to counting. And for those elementary students who might be working on more complex skills, such as circuit building, think about how you might bring in a real battery and real wires, or think about how you might have history come to life by visiting some type of a historical site. Don't be afraid if the learning outcome is different than you planned. I know in teaching today, we have a system whereby we begin with an outcome, we go through the process of, of teaching and guided participation and guided activities, and we go assess and measure that desired outcome. Given the current circumstances, this is an opportunity for us to step outside that traditional model and to think about what might be those unintended learning opportunities. Because it's sometimes in these opportunities and sometimes in these um, experiences that the deepest learning actually takes place. So when we think about the levels of learning, right? We have what we call surface level learning, which is just the ability to recite. Is that really learning? One could argue that the ability to simply recite or recall doesn't show evidence of deep learning and understanding. Deep learning, however, is that of a child or a student's ability to take knowledge and to transfer it across context, showing a firm understanding of some type of knowledge base that they can then extend. So don't be afraid to say, hey, what did you learn after I gave you that basket of acorns? Or what did I, you learn after I gave you a piece of wood in an incline and a car, car, toy car? What did you learn, right? And you yourself as the parent, as the teacher, might learn something that children are interested in that you never thought about before, which then might guide your thinking and your teaching for the remainder of um, the remainder of your remote learning experience or even when they come back in the classroom. But what about those areas that can't be learned through experimentation and manipulation of objects? Then what? This is where you, the informant, plays a significant role. And you play a significant role in the type and quality of explanations you provide to children. So much of what children seek it comes to you in the form of a question. We know that by the time children are three years old, they shift from asking what and where questions to how and why questions. In fact, they ask an average of 76 information seeking questions per hour. And I'm sure those of you who ever had the opportunity to hang out with a two or three year old, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Why mom, why mom, why mom, right? And have we ever actually stopped to think about how we respond to those whys? and how we respond to those how questions, and if those responses actually matter, or have we just always been focused on the content that we're providing? A quick story, one time I was in a, observing a preschool classroom, and I'll never forget this missed opportunity from a teacher where a child asked, where does the sun go at night? The response was, the sun goes to sleep. 
And I just, it was a cringeworthy explanation because it didn't provide ch the child with any opportunity to extend the dialogue, nor did it expend, uh, extend the opportunity for them to acquire or learn new and accurate information. So I wanna challenge you as you're working with students throughout these times that their questions are probably one of the most powerful vehicles for learning to occur right now. We are at this very unique juncture where more so than ever before, we have these one-on-one -on -one experiences, whether it's through Zoom, whether it's the parent-child interaction, or even in our classrooms that have been de-densified, that we can use those questions to really um, fuel the learning that takes place. So I wanna challenge you to think before you offer an explanation. When we talk about high quality explanations, research has shown that high quality explanations are non-circular. So for instance, if a child asks a question like, why is a polar bear white? Responding with the response of a polar bear is white because it has white fur and no other color doesn't provide them with additional information, right? It's not inaccurate, but it doesn't help them to understand or, or um, arrive at the conclusions that they were seeking by asking that question. A better response would be a polar bear is, is white because it helps protect it from its enemies. Okay. And so why these circular, non-circular explanations become so important and so powerful in teaching is not only the content that you're providing, but the child themselves is using those explanations to evaluate you and your credibility. So we have found in our research that informants who provide non-circular explanations tend to yield children who trust them more, who view them as credible learning partners. And this environment right now is all about establishing yourself as a credible source of information. Other factors and features to keep in mind is use those causal connectives. Use words like because, right? Children as young as three are detecting these words and understanding that you're providing some sort of a causal link that they can then extend to their own learning. And lastly, high quality explanations lead to further inquiry. And if that's one of our optimal goals in education, is to get back to that foundation of fostering curiosity, fostering critical thinking. What better way to do this than providing high quality explanations that are open-ended in a way that a child can, can continue that query with you as the informant, which hopefully then leads to more um, question asking and more discovery through the manipulation of their environment. Lastly, when thinking about the explanations you provide, don't be afraid if you simply do not know the answer. It's okay to not know the answer to every single child's question, especially in those secondary years or in those elementary math classrooms. I feel you parents when you're trying to learn this new way of doing long division that was never, you were never exposed to. It's okay to say, I don't know. But when you say, I don't know, should you really leave the conversation there? Better yet, why don't you think about a way to create a dialogue? For teachers, perhaps this is creating a Google Doc where students can leave you questions and you're kind of the all-knowing Oz who provides the answers or a resource where they can find the answer to their question. Play games like Stump the Teacher. Kids always love when they're able to show to the teacher that they have a question that, that can't be answered but become learning partners and discover it together. Look it up. Research actually shows that a parent or a teacher or an informant who's willing to go and discover the answer together with the child leads to a stronger relationship in terms of the credibility of that informant than an informant who simply ends the conversation, ends the dialogue with, I don't know. So I really want to challenge you with when you're thinking through the content that you're providing to students this term, these next eight weeks, whatever it may be, that this is a welcomed opportunity to have those individual conversations 
to look at the questions that children so desire to have answered and to put them into buckets. Is this a question that can be answered by the child's own discovery? If I give them the tools to discover like Piaget would do? Or is this a question that I need to provide some type of a rich explanation that perhaps is paired with or coupled with some experimentation, but really needs to be um, driven by an expert or some type of an informant? In that case, let me prepare some explanations that can lead to this further inquiry. So my final thought for you today is, I know what a big lift you are all doing as educators, as parents, wearing many, many hats. And I know people have said it, and I'll say it again, that it's okay that if the outcomes that we so desire aren't the outcomes that children are achieving. No, by answering your children's questions, sitting beside the learner, providing opportunities to manipulate your environment or manipulate their environment, learning is happening. Childhood is not a race to see how quickly a child can read, write, and count. It is a small window of time to learn and develop at a pace that is right for the individual child. Thank you for listening today. And if you have any questions, feel free to follow up. Oh, that was so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I loved the examples that you provided for K through 12. And I totally related to the how and why because I know I asked that so many times to my own parents. So um, I think there was a lot of valuable takeaways from that. It's definitely a new topic that we haven't touched on yet in this YouTube series. So thank you so much. Um, and awesome. of course, Mint's community, we're still here for you. Um, we're hoping you all, we're wishing you all the best in this transition to the fall semester, um, including you all in higher education. So please let us know if there's anything we can do for you. And also please uh, stay on the lookout for our upcoming fall workshops that we'll be hosting um, virtually on Zoom. So yes, in the meantime, again, please let us know if you have any questions or thoughts, um, but we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Take yep. care. Bye.